Hey guys, Probable 1701 here, and today I'm going to be talking about part two of Delta and the Bannerman, which I'm re-watching because my patrons and YouTube members did a vote on which story I would re-watch, and this was one of the options because it was a list of not-so-well-regarded stories, either from the fandom or from me or from both, uh, and this is the one that won. Uh, right off the bat, the incidental music has gone full-blown Benny Hill. I remember now, this is the part I didn't like. I mean, it makes sense when, uh, like, all the crew of the place are getting on the bus. It's a little funny there. But other than that, the incidental music in this one is... <laughs> Woo! I, I just, I, it's like, it's like Benny Hill. I'm just... Ooh, that incidental music is really bad. I still like the character of Burton, the guy who runs the camp. I like him. I like how he's like, well, Doctor, you're going to have to give me some proof. I was like, you want to see my ship? And Burton's just like, let's go. <laughs> and then, you know, being ex-military and all, he just takes it in stride and rolls on. I like his character a lot. I like the energy he has. Uh, I still like Ray. <clears throat> she seems to be over, you know, the guy she likes liking somebody else. She's kind of just moving on. Uh, so I'm still enjoying her in this. Uh I still like the guy playing the villain, Garrick, or whatever his name is. I just I love it just how deliciously bad he is in this. It's a little over the top, but I love it. Especially him looking like he's eating the raw meat. I just, of course he is. I like it. It's, 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 it's good without being campy, over the top, silly. It doesn't go into farce, which I still like. Uh, the police officers from the, the United States American officers <laughs> still feel like they have no point in being there. They're just there. And I get it was probably a big deal to have Gabby Hayes, but still, they're just, they don't really seem to get much use. I like the beekeeper, though. I like how he just seems to have this uh, tranquility to him. You know, he's in this very zen place. I like it. And how he can, you know, listen to the bees and the butterflies. I enjoyed that. I like that a lot. Plus, I just like the idea that in Doctor Who, bees are very intelligent, like in the modern series when they left when the reality bomb was coming in series four. I like the idea of the bees being intelligent. I'd like to see that more in Doctor Who. So I enjoy that. And the fact that it's the bees that's telling them to go there. The story is still weird with the guy falling in love with Delta, even though he barely knows her, taking everything about her just in stride. And that's some, okay. You know, the little baby that's green and growing quickly and makes the really shrill noise. And he's just, Cool. I mean, that, that, that's someone who's dedicated right there. Woo. Uh, that's, that's a little unbelievable, but all right. And the cast are doing, the rest of the cast are doing fine. I have no issues with them. Uh, it's a little weird that Garrot would kill the guy who had them trapped, you know, by setting off the little trap in his walkie talkie or whatever. Seems like you'd at least keep him alive till you got there. <coughs> Does it make sense to kill him so early? It's a little odd. Um, the busload of people being killed. I just, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Now, I do realize looking at the effect, maybe they teleported right at the last second. Like maybe the bus took off and teleported away since it can't travel in time and space. Maybe it escaped right, you know, kind of like the TARDIS does in the Five Doctors when it teleports right when the bombs go off. If you wanted to headcanon that, <coughs> at least going off episode two here, uh, I guess you could headcanon that from the way the effect looks. If not, it's just this whole busload of people, including Charlie. Just I remember watching this last time thinking, the doctor will save them somehow before it's over, and no, <laughs> they just died. I do like uh, when Charlie's trying to get them up and ready. She's like, and that one woman's like, come on, it's night on this planet and it's broad daylight. I did get a chuckle out of that, I will admit. I do feel like Delta and the Bannerman is one that's not meant to be taken completely seriously. Kind of like the Romans or the Horns of Naimon. Maybe if you're looking at it from that point of view, it's a little more bearable. It still doesn't come together very well. Um... I didn't feel like part two was quite as much of a slog to get through, even though there's still some unnecessary stuff. I do like the Bannerman's design, though, with the black and the pink sunshade. It's very 80s. It's very 80s. I'm there for that. Uh, so while it was still not an enjoyable watch, 
I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh dear God, what, I, what have I done the whole time I was sitting through it? <laughs> and that's just kind of where I land on it. The cliffhanger's fine. I actually do enjoy the cliffhanger. I like that Sylvester McCoy throws caution to the wind and just rips into him. I like when the doctor's like that. You know, he's got all these guns pointed at him, and he's all just, point a gun at me if you like. How he just walks up to him with that mad look in his eyes, like, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, I'm taking them with me, let's go. And then, of course, he's like, you know, I may have overstepped just a little bit. That's a pretty good cliffhanger. I don't know about them looking over their shoulders right then, but the him saying that line was good. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Whitaker in Spyfall Part 1 when she confronts the kind of Steve Jobs guy. I like how there's no subtlety to it. There's no subterfuge. She just, okay, this, this, this. Part of you's not human. What's going on? One of the times I feel like Whitaker really shone in the role is when she just flat out confronted the Steve Jobs guy about it. I like that. And that's kind of what McCoy does here too. Just confronts him, just straight up. You know, you violated this, you violated this. You know, let us go. I'll speak for leniency and mercy. I just love the fact he's not having any crap. I enjoyed that. So, uh, yeah, still not essential Doctor Who. Still not even very good Doctor Who, but at least part two felt watchable, maybe? We'll see. We'll see how the story wraps up in part three. So I want to know what you think of part two of Delta and the Bannerman. So comment down below and let me know. Don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button. And if you would like to vote in these polls um, for stories that I watch, um, you can check out my Patreon. There's links to that in the description below. Several different tiers there to choose from. Although these days, I mean, since, you know, there's not that many people on the Patreon, I tend to let everybody vote at any tier level right now. Um, even the entry level tiers lately, I've been letting them vote in polls. Uh, YouTube memberships are also available. They also get to vote in polls and I've been letting them do that at every tier level as well just to get more votes in. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I do appreciate their support, as I do the support of all of my patrons. It is appreciated. And most importantly, thank you for watching.